My name is Mohammed Talhabashir and I am the Aberdeen Rep for the Neurological and Neurosurgical Student Interest Group. This is a talk on delirium, which was constructed with the kind help of Mr. Pragnesh Bhatt, who is a consultant neurosurgeon at Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. This talk aims to cover delirium as an overview, aimed principally at senior medical students and junior doctors. However, anyone with an interest may watch and learn from this. We aim to cover the background of delirium, providing a short description of the condition, as well as discussing its importance and implications, the theories that exist behind its pathophysiology, risk factors to look out for and triggers to prevent, the range of clinical manifestations of delirium, a comparison with its main differential, which is dementia, how to screen for it in practice and how to diagnose it, and finally prevention, which is mainly done by preventing and managing risk factors and management. There are a number of definitions for delirium. I have the Medscape one here. The key points are that delirium is a cause of mental dysfunction, which manifests with a wide range of neuropsychiatric symptoms. These symptoms are usually transient and reversible. It's important to learn because firstly, it's very common, affecting between 20 and 30% of inpatients and up to half of post-surgical patients. And it has several important clinical implications, including an increased rate of hospitalization, increased mortality, longer length of stay, and long-term cognitive decline. An example of this could be that having delirium increases your risk of dementia, and an episode of delirium is linked with worsening of already existing dementia. There exist several theories which try to explain the onset of delirium. However, we will discuss three of them in this talk, the first of which pertains to neurotransmitters, Patients with delirium often have raised levels of dopamine, which is why antipsychotics such as haloperidol are often used in therapy. It is also thought that low levels of acetylcholine may trigger delirium, which is why medications like anticholinergics are often avoided. Finally, GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, often has decreased levels in delirium, and this may be brought on by things like benzodiazepine use or alcohol withdrawal. The second theory pertains to inflammatory cytokines, namely IL-1 and IL-6. It is thought that as they are neurotoxic, events that may raise IL-1 and IL-6 levels, such as infections, inflammation, toxic insults, ischemia, and head injury may trigger delirium. The third theory pertains to the blood-brain barrier. It's thought that a disruption in the blood-brain barrier may allow these neurotoxic cytokines to enter into the brain. Delirium has four main risk factors, being age 65 plus, having a severe illness, having a current hip fracture and having cognitive impairment. If cognitive impairment exists in a patient, this should be confirmed using a standardized and validated cognitive impairment measure. Delirium has several triggers, However, these can be memorized using the mnemonic delirium. D stands for drugs, including withdrawal, toxicity, and also anticholinergics, as well as dehydration. E is electrolyte imbalance. L means level of pain. I describes infection and inflammation, including being post-surgery. R is respiratory failure, including hypoxia and hypercapnia. I is impaction of feces, which means constipation. U is urinary retention, and M is a metabolic disorder, which could be, for example, liver or renal failure or hypoglycemia, and also myocardial infarction. However, not included in this mnemonic are sleep disturbance and brain injury. Delirium has four key features. One is an acute and fluctuant nature, the second is inattention. One may ask, did the patient have difficulty focusing attention? For example, were they being easily distractible or having difficulty keeping track of what was being said? Next is disorganized thinking. One may ask if the patient's thinking was disorganized or incoherent. Were they rambling or having any irrelevant conversation? Did they display any unclear or illogical flow of ideas? Or were they unpredictably switching from subject to subject? Finally is disturbed consciousness. 
This can present in a hyperactive picture, meaning a patient that could be agitated and nervous. Secondly is a hypoactive picture, which could be a lethargic and sleepy patient. And finally is a mixed picture, which is a mix of both. Now these three terms, hyperactive, hypoactive and mixed, they describe the three main clinical classifications of delirium you might find in practice. For diagnosis, you can use the confusion assessment method. This combines the first two features, acute and fluctuant course and inattention, with one of either disorganized thinking and disturbed consciousness. And this will give you a clinical diagnosis of delirium. Additional symptoms are sleep disturbance, emotional disturbance, meaning a patient that might display signs of anxiety or depression, and changes in perception, for example, delusions or hallucinations. There are several differential diagnoses for delirium. The main one is dementia, which we will discuss in the next slide. We also have depression and psychosis. It's important to compare the features of delirium with those of dementia, its key differential. Firstly, delirium is abrupt in onset and acute in course, whereas dementia is more insidious in onset and obviously is a chronic condition. Next, delirium displays hourly variation, so it's highly fluctuant, whereas symptoms in dementia may display variation, but they're more at a day-to-day -day basis. Regarding symptoms, altered consciousness is a key feature of delirium, whereas it is only really present at a late stage in dementia. Delirium has a prominent sleep-wake cycle change, whereas it's less prominent in dementia, Psychomotor changes and abnormal perceptions are seen at an early stage in delirium, whereas they are not as common and only really appear at a late stage in dementia. For screening for delirium, one can use the 4AT. This is a short tool that assesses four features and a score of four or above suggests potential delirium. The first feature is alertness. This can be assessed by noting if the patient is drowsy or hyperactive. The second is the AMT4. This asks the patient to state their age, date of birth, the place in which they currently are and the current year. The third is a test of attention. This asks the patient to list the months of the year backwards from December to January, and finally is a description of symptoms as either being an acute change or a fluctuant course. After the 4AT has been done, one can come to a diagnosis using either the previously mentioned confusion assessment method, or we can use the DSM-5 criteria, which lists three main features, disturbance in consciousness, disturbance in cognition, and an acute and fluctuating course, coupled with evidence of a trigger or an underlying cause. This can be through symptoms, through examination, or through laboratory tests. The mainstay of delirium management comes from identifying patients who are at risk and implementing preventative measures. The first of these could be ensuring that care is being delivered to patients by carers that know them, Secondly, it's important to not move patients between wards or rooms unless strictly necessary. And the third of which is to prevent and control triggers. Examples could be monitoring and managing cognitive impairment, maintaining hydration, addressing and treating infections, addressing immobility, managing pain with appropriate pain medication, conducting a full medication review, including the removal of non-necessary anticholinergics, making sure nutrition is adequate, and promoting good sleep patterns and good sleep hygiene. For management, one should first implement the time bundle. This is a four-step checklist, the T standing for think, exclude, and treat possible triggers, prompting the clinician to look for things like sepsis, blood glucose abnormalities, triggering medications, persisting pain, urinary retention, and constipation. The I stands for investigate and intervene to correct underlying causes, for which the clinician should assess hydration, conduct a full blood screen, look for signs of infection, 
and perform adequate cultures and imaging and conduct an ECG. The M is management plan, prompting the individual to initiate treatment for the causes and triggers found in the above two steps. And E is engage and explore, for which the individual should engage with the patient and any family or carers, ask what is normal for the patient and if they would like to be involved, explain the diagnosis of delirium to them and to document this diagnosis. Additionally, it's important to frequently reorient the patient, contact psychiatry for review, and if delirium symptoms are interrupting essential treatment, to start an antipsychotic. The current guidance recommends haloperidol. However, monitoring must be done for long QT syndrome. It's also important to avoid unnecessary interventions or procedures like catheterization and disturbing patients' sleeping patterns whilst on ward rounds. Thank you for listening to this talk. Further reading can be found on the Alzheimer's Society, through Medscape, through the NICE guidelines, and through Guys and Thomas's hospital guidance. I would like to thank Mr. Pragnish Bhatt for his guidance, and Ashwin Makatesh from Nansig.